Hi, this is Dr. Kat Fleece from Central New Mexico Community College. In this video C, we're going to focus on the gross anatomy of the kidneys, including their blood supply. The kidneys are fascinating organs. As you know very well, when a patient is in kidney failure, it usually is pretty bad news. That tells you how important a role the kidneys play in our body. Not only are they responsible for creating urine, in order to make that urine, they must or they go through the process of regulating anything and everything about our blood, whether it's the concentration of solutes, the pH, the volume, the pressure of the blood, uh, the list goes on. In addition, our kidneys are very important endocrine organs. They produce a variety of hormones. Let's take a look at these really fascinating organs. Aside from some of the functions I just listed, there are even more listed here that we will expand on as we get to these topics. But notice how busy our kidneys are. They filter 200 liters of blood daily. That is about 50 gallons of blood every single day. Just like the ureters and the bladder, the kidneys sit retroperitoneally. If we take a look at the relative position of our kidneys, our right kidney, and we're looking at a posterior view, so this is the right kidney, sits a little bit lower than the left because of our big gigantic liver that is positioned just superior to that kidney. When we point to our kidneys, we often point too low. As you can tell, they're still protected by the rib cage. So we should really feel for those last couple of ribs to really uh, point to our uh, kidneys in our backs. Not only do the kidneys sit retroperitoneally, you see the peritoneum shown right here with the kidney sitting behind them, but they're also nicely protected by a fibrous capsule, which is what directly covers the kidney, or each kidney, I should say. There's also a nice fatty capsule that surrounds that capsule, that fibrous capsule, I should say. And finally, we have some fascia that are referred to as the renal fascia that literally anchor the kidneys in place. So it is possible for these kidneys to shift when we lose way too much fast too soon. Now remember what we said a moment ago, 200 liters of blood are filtered by the kidneys daily. That tells you that blood needs to have a pretty easy pathway to reach the kidneys. And indeed they do. If this is our descending aorta here, then we see direct deep to this vein here, renal veins, I'm sorry, renal arteries leading into each kidney. And we also have direct connections with the inferior vena cava via the renal veins. Once the renal arteries reach the kidneys, they start to immediately divide uh, to reach specific areas of the kidneys. And before we can learn about these different branches of the kidneys, we must learn the internal anatomy of our kidney. As I mentioned already, each kidney is protected by a nice fibrous capsule called the renal capsule. And then we see two distinct layers in the kidney, layer names that you're pretty familiar with. We have the cortex area right here. And then we have the medulla area here. So within the medulla, we find these structures and we call them renal pyramids. So in the renal medulla, that is where we find the renal pyramids. In between the pyramids, we have renal columns. And then finally, not labeled so much on this particular figure, but if we combine a pyramid with the cortical portion above it, then we refer to this whole region, 
like so, as a lobe. Finally, I should point out that it is in these pyramids that the urine that was formed is going to be guided by all kinds of tubules and ducts towards these little openings, which we call the renal papillae, singular papilla. And this is where the urine literally gets dumped into these regions here. Some of them are uh, smaller and then they merge together to become bigger. So we talk about the, mi the major and the minor calyces and they eventually form a more triangular region right here which is referred to as the renal pelvis and that is what then leads into our ureter. So again we're going to see that the blood is actually going to be filtered in the cortex area right here. From the cortex area, the filtrate that is formed will then be guided into tubules that eventually merge to form ducts. And these ducts eventually create these little openings that connect with first the minor and then the major calyces. These little openings we call the papillae. These calyces, which is plural for calyx, and calyces is spelled as follows. Calyces. From the renal pelvis then, I'm sorry, these calyces form the renal pelvis, which then gets us to the ureter. So now you already have an idea of the flow of urine. And now with all of this terminology behind you, you will have a better understanding of why we give the names to all of these different blood vessels. So let's take a look at the flow of the blood in the, in the kidney. So here we see our renal artery carrying the blood from the aorta directly into the kidneys and the moment that renal artery enters the kidneys, it starts to separate into major branches that we refer to as segmental arteries. Each segmental artery in turn then is going to snake in between our pyramids and therefore we call them interlobar arteries because a pyramid together with its cortical area, cortical referring to the cortex, we call a lobe. So these vessels, this one should have been shifted a little bit more this way, I should say, but in each segmental artery will give rise to an interlobar artery that is going to sit in between our lobes. That interlobar artery will then give rise to much, uh, will, I'm sorry, will then curve around our, the top of each pyramid and form kind of an arc-like artery. We call that the arcuate artery. So this is another arcuate artery. And arising from the arcuate artery, we have much, much smaller, tiny little arteries that start to enter into the cortical area where the actual filtration process of the blood occurs. And those we call interlobular arteries, not to be confused with interlobar. So we call them interlobular. The interlobular areas, I'm sorry, arteries, which we see illustrated here, are then going to give rise to very small arterioles referred to as the afferent arterioles, which are then going to enter into this capillary bed that is part of the functional unit of all kidneys called the nephron. And this capillary bed gets a unique name. It is called the glomerulus. This capillary bed is unusual in that it's going to then lead the blood out 
back into yet another arteriole, so not a venule this time, called the efferent arteriole. This efferent arteriole then becomes part of yet another capillary bed that forms a nice big cobweb around all of these tubes that are for part of our so-called nephron that you'll learn more about on the next video or in the next video. These are referred to as the peritubular capillaries. This is a regular capillary bed, meaning that it's going to drain into a venule that you see right here that will then lead into an interlobular vein. And now you really literally are going to work backwards using the terminology that you learned in the arterial system of the kidneys. So the interlobular veins are going to merge to form the arcuate veins, which in turn form the interlobar veins, which then eventually become the segmental veins. Now your book doesn't mention segmental veins, but I really believe that we could add them. These segmental veins will then merge to form the renal vein. And so this is an overview of the blood flow. We will, as I mentioned, learn in great detail about this nephron because it's right here at the level where we have this specialized capillary bed called the glomerulus where the blood is filtered and the filtrate will then end up inside of this particular structure of our nephron. That filtrate that forms from filtra the filtration process will then go through all of these tubules and there are many, 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 many of these tubules that will then eventually end up merging with the calyces, as explained earlier. The kidneys are also supplied by sympathetic fibers almost exclusively. So one of the things to bear in mind is that the renal plexus is exclusively or almost exclusively sympathetic fibers. So there's no dual innervation in the case of the kidneys. These sympathetic fibers play a very important role in vasoconstriction and vasodilation. So we tend to refer to them as vasomotor fibers. That's going to help with how much blood can enter into the kidneys. And we're going to learn that these sympathetic fibers actually also have control over certain hormones that we'll uh, learn more by, about, such as renin, and therefore indirectly have an effect on water and sodium reabsorption. This then wraps up our discussion of the anatomy of the kidneys. We looked at the regions in the kidneys along with the blood flow and the nerve supply.